Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back to uh, our class this evening. Uh, welcome to everybody who's tuning in on Zoom. Again, uh, this class is going to be recorded tonight, uh, so uh, Bill will have more details on that um, as needed. But uh, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to uh, get to teach again. Uh, thankful for the opportunity to have been with you uh, last week uh, when we talked about the Christian and the First Amendment. So this topic, uh, when does anger become sin? And then uh, subtitle, I've, I've changed it a little bit from how do we handle our, how, how does the Bible want us to handle our anger to uh, other pertinent questions and conclusions uh, that we'll get to. When Bill first um, approached me with the list of topics, this is one of the ones uh, that I immediately volunteered for. And the reason being, when I teach a class, I think it's very good to teach to myself. So this is something that, um, especially in my younger days, uh, my temper could get the best of me in certain things. Uh, I'm not going to let Adam Spencer tell any college stories right now since we, we lived together uh, in a suite at Marietta College for two years. But uh, some stories about me. Yeah, but I mean, that's true. We could, we could talk about a variety of different things. But I feel like this is something that I've gotten better at. Uh, and I don't see my wife uh, logging on yet. Uh, she's taking care of our, our baby. But it's something that I hope I've gotten better at, but I know I need to continue to work on. And I know many of us need to continue to work on uh, the topic of anger. So when does anger become sin? To start, I always like to define terms. And when we talk about anger, we know that anger is an emotion. What is an emotion? It's kind of a hard topic uh, to define if I were just to ask you on the spot. The definition of an emotion actually uh, lacks a scientific consensus according to most sources. So it's a little bit out there. Uh, I did a lot of reading on this, and my favorite thing that I found was an article in Psychology Today, and uh, this article posits that there's two primary scientific explanations for our emotions, and they can also can be combined into a dual theory. But uh, the cognitive appraisal theory is one in which emotions are simply judgments about the extent that a current situation meets your goals. So if something doesn't jive with how you expect it to be, if it doesn't turn out the way you want it, that can cause anger. Uh, the other scientific explanation is uh, one that was accepted by many people, including William James, who's a very famous uh, psychologist. And the argument there is that emotions are perceptions of the, of the physiological changes in your body, such as heart rate, breathing rate, perspiration, and hormone levels. A lot of psychologists uh, will take these two theories and combine them together, and that is what makes an emotion. So that's what makes um, uh, things like, that's what makes uh, something occur like anger. I don't know if you, you subscribe to any of this. I thought it was interesting, so I wanted to share it uh, when we talked about emotions. So anger is an emotion which leads to the question of what is anger? How would we define anger? So per Merriam-Webster, anger is, we're talking about that something that happens that doesn't meet your expectations, like a, uh, with, the, with the general definition of emotion, but anger is a strong feeling of displeasure and it usually involves antagonism, which antagonism in turn means actively expressed opposition or hostility kind of uh, boiled down to some uh, very big words there. Anger often causes a person to be tempted to take revenge on some, uh, someone or something. And then it has, like emotions, a physiological response. And that includes um, increased heart rate, usually elevated blood pressure and high levels of adrenaline. And again, these are all just basic explanations for what, uh, for what this term means. So what makes us angry. It might seem obvious and it might not even really need to be stated, but people experience anger 
uh, in different ways and during a variety of situations and from a range of causes. And what might make one person angry might not necessarily make another person angry. What makes you angry at a certain stage in your life might not make you angry at a different stage in your life. I want you to think about, as we go through uh, the next passages of scriptures, and we talk about what the Bible says about anger, what makes you angry? And is it okay? And I promise there will be an opportunity to discuss and answer some of that. Okay. What does the Bible say about anger? I tried to look at this from uh, a very large perspective and to see uh, where all the anger passages come in. And when, when you're looking at the Bible in this way, uh, you have to realize that the words that we, we have are English words. They can vary by translation. They might be slightly different than uh, the Greek word that was used. And then we, when we talk about the Old Testament, you're talking about, the, about these things uh, being used in the Bible. But when I looked at it, I found that the Bible is, it contains hundreds of references to anger using English words, specifically in the English Standard Version. For example, if you go to uh, Bible, study, uh, uh, Bible study tools online and you search the text of the ESV for passages that use the word anger, that's our English word anger that we talked about in Merriam-Webster, you get 269 results. If you search for angry, you're going to get 89 results. If you search for wrath, you're going to get 209 results. As I look through these passages and I tried to uh, figure out um, a theme and, and just and give you a, a summary of some of the things that I found, uh, many of the Old Testament passages that use these words uh, concern God's anger with rebellious Israel or disobedient followers. I counted 34 references to anger in Jeremiah alone. And if you remember uh, last week, if you were here and we talked about uh, Jeremiah being persecuted by the authorities uh, for prophesying the truth and what he was talking about uh, primarily was the wrath of God is going to come on upon you because you've been disobedient. And here's what's, what's going to happen as a result of that. Uh, so there's a lot of references to anger in Jeremiah. Proverbs is very well known for its passages related to controlling anger and some very good practical advice. In the New Testament, there are fewer references. I found uh, by searching the ESV text, 13 references for the uh, English word anger, eight for angry, and 36 for wrath. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, many of the references for wrath I found in, uh, in Revelation. So once I looked at the English words, and once you could do that, um, I will say the same thing uh, that I said last week, as I, I was not a constitutional scholar or uh, anyone well-versed in the law. I also am not, um, uh, am not familiar with Greek. I can't read it, uh, but I can read Strong's Concordance. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where I go for these sorts of things. So I, I searched through Strong's Concordance, and just as a note for everyone, uh, there is an online version of that now, which is extremely useful and uh, very great for, uh, for searching uh, rather than trying to look it up in the actual book version of the concordance. But uh, Strong's Concordance for the New American Standard Version, there are six references uh, to anger and 30 for wrath that use a specific Greek word. And this Greek word, uh, I put the phonetic spelling here, it's orge. Uh, it looks like it should be... Uh, I. If I had a typo in the slides that say ogre, I apologize ahead of time on that because that's what I kept wanting to type. But orge, and it, orge is a word for anger in the Greek. It has a very similar meaning to our, uh, our Merriam-Webster definition, what we would think of anger, of that feeling of displeasure that can result in, in uh, antagonism, which is uh, the display of 
outright hostility or, um, or conflict. Per Strong's Concordance, I also found 18 references to another word for anger called thumos, and I hope I'm pronouncing that one correctly, but that is a word for anger which has a connotation of boiling. So you boil up and you get angry and then uh, you, uh, you are uh, displaying that very, a very volatile or very volcanic process. So those are the two primary words uh, that, uh, that you're going to find if you're looking up uh, in the New Testament, the words for anger. So if you're going through all these passages and you're looking about what the Bible says, as, as, uh, says about anger, I also want to get a little bit more specific. Most of the in, uh, New Testament passages list anger as something that we want to avoid as Christians. For example, um, fits of anger, and this is a reference to, again, that thumos, uh, which is the boiling anger uh, uh, Greek word, are listed among the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verses 19 uh, through, uh, through 21. In Ephesians 4, uh, 4, 30 and 31, which is a passage that we're going to come back to a couple different times, both the Greek words orge and th uh, thumos are used in tandem. And here they are, I have them, um, if you can see the slides, I do have them uh, marked for you. Those brackets are my uh, insertion, uh, so you can see where the word was used. Starting in verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath, thumos, and anger, orge, and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. So. We have uh, several passages like this that talk about anger in a dangerous and, uh, and sinful form that we should not have as, as, as Christians. Give me, one, give me a chance to get through my slides, Jay, and I, I will take questions here in just a bit. So those, those are some of the references. Now, the word anger, and uh, specifically orge in Greek, is used positively in a couple uh, in a couple references, in several in relation to, uh, to God, and at least once in a positive connection with Jesus. And there is a concept. I I don't know if this is the, this phrase never appears in the Bible. I have it uh, in our, my slide header uh, in quotation marks. Righteous anger. Uh, would be the phrase that we'll, we'll use a couple times. And I do want to make that clear that that's not a phrase that, I'm, that we're drawing from the Bible. That's just a phrase that uh, has been used. But this concept of anger being used in a positive connotation, in a positive light, um, is, uh, is not, uh, it d does exist in the Bible. Here's the passage that uh, I found in connection with Jesus when it's specifically used and specifically stated. And again, this is that Greek word uh, called orge. Mark 3, uh, verses 4 to 6. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees who are trying to catch him and to healing a man on the Sabbath, and they're trying anything they can to discredit him. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked at them, he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with Herodians against him, how to destroy him. One of the other passages that you probably uh, were thinking of about anger being connected to Jesus uh, in a fully justified manner and in the way that uh, that he conducted himself Jesus exhibited this angry behavior in all four gospels all four gospels with the money changers and the people who were doing business in the temple and corrupting what was the the purity of worship basically um, we'll read these passages about it but one thing I do want to again make clear is that Jesus um, Jesus did this, but the word anger or angry is not used. So 
I don't know if Jesus was angry in this, in this circumstance. It certainly looks like he was. We only have the passages for this, but I just want to point that out that that word's not used, but, and a lot of, uh, a lot of times I think it's, it's kind of inserted in there that Jesus was angry. Bible doesn't say that. I don't know if he was or not, but the behavior, uh, the behavior and the way that he talked about it does look like uh, he, he probably was. Um, Matthew 21, 12 through 13. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. One of the reasons that we do think uh, that I think that it, it, it's not a problem to read anger <laughs> into this um, might be with the detail that John gives that Jesus even made a whip of cords to do this, um, starting in uh, verse 14 of chapter 2. In the temple, we found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured the coins, uh, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And uh, he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So those are some of the examples of Jesus um, that we get with, when we were talking about anger in the Bible. Other examples of anger that are expressed positively in the Bible, we have several uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive, li exhaustive uh, list or all-encompassing that you're going to hear me say a couple different times. This is what I could fit on the slide as a good summation for you. But um, in Romans 1.18, uh, this was uh, part of our, our lesson on Sunday morning. Uh, but God's wrath on unrighteousness, um, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The fact that people, there are people who would um, su suppress the truth, who would teach what is not true, who would, keep what is, who would keep what is true from being taught is something that angers God. Romans 1.18 says that. Um, another example of anger being used, though, again, we don't have words that say anger. We don't see have to say anger, angry, anger, wrath. But if you think back to Galatians chapter two, and specifically in eleven verses eleven through fourteen, Paul was confronting Peter, and what Peter was doing basically was acting hypocritically uh, when you know he would not eat with the Gentile Christians when other uh, Hebrew background Christians were there. That's, that's it in a nutshell. He was behaving, behaving hypocritically, and it was causing some problems. And the scripture says that Paul withstood him to his face. And so again, kind of reading into that, um, that Paul was probably angry uh, because of the way the, the words that were used. But again, ang anger is not necessarily used there. Another one is David's anger over the prophets over, over Nathan's the prophet Nathan the prophet's story in 2 Samuel 12. Nathan's telling uh, David, King David, a story about what David did to Uriah, murdering him uh, so he could get Bathsheba his wife. And so Nathan the prophet is putting this in a story form of well, here was this rich man who had all these sheep, and he takes the poor man's one sheep that was very one, one lamb rather that was very dear to him and then you know slaughtered it and served it up when nathan tells that story to da uh, to david david is upset he had said that the scripture says that he's angry about it and then nathan comes back and tells david you you are the man who did that um so david couldn't see his own his own mistake but he could be angry over the injustice that he saw in this story uh, which it, it truly was uh, an injustice and, and sin. And finally, uh, Nehemiah's anger over uh, the oppression of the poor in Nehemiah uh, 5, chapters, uh, uh, verses, chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. I do recommend that uh, you, if you are taking notes, that you do go back and read this passage. Um, but basically, uh, people were being taken advantage of, and their children were being 
sold into slavery for not being able to pay their debts. And these were Israelites doing this. These were Hebrews doing this to, to Hebrews. And Nehemiah is saying, we don't, don't be doing this. This is wrong. And it, he is angry over what, uh, over what he's seeing uh, when, this, uh, when this comes up. So again, this is not an exhaustive list. I wanted to throw these out there uh, so that we could um, use them as, as background. Um, but think about some of these things and uh, think about some other ones uh, that, that might be, um, that might be uh, useful uh, to help frame our minds for the second part of, of this lesson of when does anger become sin. So let's revisit this slide. So as promised, let's discuss this for a few minutes. What makes you angry? Is it okay to be angry? See, a lot of people were looking stuff up while I was, uh, while I was talking here. What did I get wrong, for instance? So uh, if you want to share that right now, too, we, we could do that. So now we'll, we'll go to comments. Jay, you had your hand up earlier. I'll let you go first. Well, the, uh, the one verse that had the, you had your Greek word for wrath and anger, you used them both in the same verse. And it, it, it just it made me wonder, are, these, are they just straight synonyms or they have different shades of meaning? I'm not, it might be hard to tell what that would be. Though. Well, actually, it, diff, different shades. So those... Um, those, ver those uh, words that were used in tandem were orge and thumos. And so orge is very similar to what we would consider anger in our definition. So when we looked at that Merriam-Webster definition, that anger is that feeling of displeasure. Um, it often results in that antagonism, which is an outright show of hostility. That is the orge anger that was used in that passage. Interestingly enough, in that passage, Orge is translated as anger. The other word, thumos, is translated as wrath. And the thumos, uh, the shade there is it's anger, but it's got the connotation of like boiling up. So just an expression, a fit of rage is what, uh, is what that word uh, uh, sort of means. And they are very similar. So the other thing is, again, when we talk about the imprecision of uh of uh, translations. The word love is a great example that there are different Greek words for love that mean slightly different things. In the Bible here, we, we, in our English translations, we get love and we don't always understand the difference because it just says love. In this way too, you have, I found different instances where uh, wrath was the orge based on the context. And then it was thumos in, in other words, the same English word. Same thing with anger. So it's, it, it can be a little imprecise in our English versions when we look at these. And that's why I think it's helpful to look at, at the Greek too, just to know what they mean. I, I did look a lot at the two words in comparison, but again, a lot of times they were used in tandem. They were used in, in, in context. So it, 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 I will say that it could be a rabbit hole to go down, but it could be a very useful one at some point. So uh, I even have, uh, Jay, if you want, I have the strongest importance uh, numbers that uh, escape me at the moment. So you can look those up and then, and then track, track them through, through the scripture. That's a great question. Adam. At least for me, when I think about the word wrath, it usually entails some sort of like follow-up action with it. Like when you incur the wrath of God is he's going to punish you, right? Right. Whereas anger is more just like the raw emotion that you feel at something. So it, it almost seems like it says it's boiling up, it's like boiling over, like it, it ends up with some sort of response with wrath is how I think about it anyways. That's a great point. And then if you're, if you're looking at this, and again, when, when those words are coming in, uh, the wrath that, um, that we talked about that, that appears a lot in Revelation is talking about that wrath of God that it's anger that results in punishment. And that is, the, that, is that thumos word uh, that's used. So that's a, really good, that's a really good analogy and a good way to put it, that that, that anger is, uh, that boiling up connotation results in an action. Another comment? Another comment? Popped in my head with the discussion of wrath. I was thinking of Mozart's Requiem, Decere, Decere, Day of Wrath in Latin. And the... And it's God, 
with all that other stuff and then Requiem and God taking his wrath at the, at the judgment day. Well, we're going to come back to this too. This is when we, if we leave this behind, if you don't want to respond to any of this now, we are going to come back to it. What makes us angry? Think about that for yourself. Is it okay to be angry? I have what I think is a good biblical stance on that. Um, that is not exhaustive, but let's let's go through that, and we can come back to this at any time. I do want to discuss this more at the end, uh, because in this is a very good, practical, real life topic of things that are going on right now. But looking at all those conclude of all the scriptures that you can find of the scriptures that we've talked about of the discussions that we had, I think you can draw two key conclusions. Number one. I highlighted the scripture that, uh, that is best known for this. It is possible to be angry without sinning. The Bible says this explicitly. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to, to the devil. So it's possible to be angry without sinning, but notice the caveats there. Notice what follows that you don't hold on to it. The second conclusion, anger can lead to sin or be in and of itself outright sinful. In the same Ephesians passage, chapter 4, verses 30 through 31. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and that's those orge and thumos uh, words uh, being used together there, and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So the Bible tells us it's possible to be angry without sinning, but sin but anger can lead to sin or in and of itself be sinful. So we get to the point of our lesson. When does anger become sin? If we use the context of the scriptures, what we've been talking about, some of these passages as, as we've gone through and just looked at all the different references and numbers and specificities, I think there's a few general principles that we can draw. It's not an exhaustive list. It's not all encompassing. Just three things that I want us to think on and that I want to leave you with that we can discuss. Number one, anger becomes sin when it progresses from a defensive reaction to malicious action. So think about what Adam said with wrath leading to, you know, an action. When anger progresses from a defensive reaction to a malicious action, it becomes sin. Well, I'll explain that more in a second. Second, anger becomes sin when it overwhelms the focus on serving God. And number three, anger becomes sin when it hinders a relationship with God. So those three points, let's look at those and then discuss. So anger becomes sin, and this is my, this is my phrase and this is my term when it goes from a defensive reaction to a malicious action. You think about these scriptures that we reviewed, the positive examples that were depicting anger. When Jesus was angry at the Pharisees, when he looked at them with anger, it was a reaction to the fact that I'm going to perform, a, he's going to perform a miracle here to help someone. And all they wanted to do was catch him in wrongdoing. This is the, the person that they had been waiting for. The Messiah was standing right there in front of them. And they didn't want him. And you get the sense that that's, that's a defensive reaction. With uh, King David, it's a reaction of, I'm angry at this story because of this injustice that happened. So you look at what the aftermath of those examples were. Jesus used those after, the, the, uh, the aftermath from the instance we discussed for him to teach. He didn't stay angry. He used it to teach. David used his for repentance. Paul and Peter kept preaching the gospel as Christian brothers. 
And Nehemiah helped institute reforms as a result of that. Letting your anger take over for retribution or revenge is sinful based on what we see in the Bible. That's the conclusion that I think we have to draw when you let that go the extra step from that initial emotion, from that feeling to that malicious action. Some scriptures on that. Matthew chapter 5, 20 through 22, the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So it's letting that anger take the step and it just keeps progressing. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And then uh, this is, I have found so many great Old Testament passages, hard to share um, in a class that, that's only, only tonight. But Psalm 37, uh, verse 8, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. So the conclusion that I draw is that when you can have that reaction, you can be angry and not sin. But when you take the next step to do something that is, you've let that anger take a hold of you, that seems to be sinful according to the Bible. The second point, anger becomes sin when it overwhelms one's focus on serving God. Unrestrained anger, or really, really any other temptation to sin, can become so consuming that it just overwhelms our focus on serving God. And when we reach that point where something else is what we're focused on and God's on the back burner, I think that's pretty clearly sinful based, uh, based on the Bible. It also can be a factor in Christians going astray. For example, anger at Paul and other evangelists for pointing out their sinful behavior seem to be one of the big problems at the congregation at Corinth. And the, the Corinthians had many, many problems. Second Corinthians chapter 12, uh, 19 through 21, Paul writing, have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your uploading, beloved. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and fear. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you. And I, but anyway, this is an example of anger, among other problems, getting in the way of these Christians serving God. And instead they were following, they were going down a path of sin uh, that Paul was desperately trying to turn them away from. Okay, last point. Anger can become sin when it hinders a relationship with God. And I termed this that way because anger can damage your own or someone else's relationship with God. It's two different ways this can work. It has a place in our emotions and it can be justified at times. But think about this question. Will you be able to grow spiritually or influence others to hear the gospel message or mature in their faith? Constant emotion that's just cultivating. If you're angry all the time, Will people listen to you looking out for what God's doing for you? you? Use this passage. You're probably wondering where it's going to come in. The bottom line is the Bible says our anger and even righteous anger, it cannot produce 
the righteousness of God. So we have to be careful. James 1, 19 through 21. Every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the right wickedness. That's my emphasis on the, on the last part of that passage. And we talked about this a little bit last week, too, that no matter what happens in this life, no matter what we're doing in this life, it doesn't really matter if there's no gospel that saves us. And if we're not saved by the gospel, then that, that, that's the most important thing that we can do. Nothing else really matters. Repeating Ephesians 40 to uh, 30, and I'm adding verse 32 on this passage. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender and hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So some practical things to end with our discussion here. What can we do about our anger? How can we keep our anger from turning to sin? One of the things that I think of a lot when I'm upset with a person or a situation is that our true enemy is not that person or the situation. Our true enemy is not of this world. Our true enemy is Satan. He's in this world. He's not of it. For we do not wrestle, this is Ephesians 6, 12, against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And you're probably familiar with this passage because what immediately follows is Paul's exhortation to take up the whole armor of God. Something else we can do, and this one seems very obvious, but I think it's good to be reminded, we can pray to God to help us control or avoid anger, even if it's righteous anger, to prevent us from letting it become sin. Third thing, very practical, we're doing it right now, keep studying our Bibles. There's a big difference between Bible reading and Bible studying. And when you're studying, you're putting things together, you're looking at everything as the big picture, and you're not just picking out passages, we're looking uh, for, some, uh, 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 for some guidance. Uh, for example, Proverbs, as, as mentioned earlier, has some great practical wisdom. Uh, I will have all these slides available, and again, this is being recorded. We can look at these. I have this one uh, highlighted, uh, or actually bolded, uh, Proverbs 15, 1. This was a favorite of my father's when he was a principal uh, in a K through eight public school in Monroe County. And it's the way he would deal with parents. He would, he would quote this to me that when somebody came in yelling and, and screaming at them, he'd let them, he'd let them do it. And then he would have uh, a soft answer. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And you'd be surprised if you really put this into practice and you think about it when you're faced with something like this. And I don't know if anyone has a forward facing customer service type job. Uh, I do at times. And uh, many times, you know, you, you're just taking it. You're just taking all that anger. And if you come back guns blazing, you're probably going to be in an argument. If you come back and say something they don't expect, like, you know, those are good points. I appreciate your feedback. And uh, we'll take all that into account. Uh, many, many times, not always, but many times it ends the hostility right there. And then, of course, we do have uh, some other ones here uh, that I'm not going to go over uh, specifically right now, but again, will be available by email um, if you uh, want it. For these slides, here's my contact information. I'm happy to send all these notes to you um, at uh, your convenience. But questions, comments, more discussion, Lynn. I know for myself when I get angry with someone, if I'm then harboring, harboring those feelings, I start praying for them <laughs> specifically because it's really hard to stay mad at somebody that you're actively praying for. It helps me, and I'm sure it helps talking with them. Excellent point. For those of you on Zoom, I don't know if you heard that. Lynn said, when you're praying, pray for the person that you're angry at. And I've heard this in practical wisdom, and we do. I, and this helps a lot in relationships. I know too. Uh, you do something. You can't stay mad at someone if you are looking out for their well-being. So if you're mad at someone, do something nice for them, and you won't be as mad for them. Same principle. If you're praying for that person, 
you it's going to be awfully hard to stay mad at them if if you are lifting them up to, to God in prayer. David? To the last point about uh, anger becoming sin when it hinders the relationship with God, you can always say that it becomes sin when it hinders your relationship with other people. Because if it's affecting your relationship with somebody, that's probably going down the route of sin. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good point. And that, again, that list was not meant to be, you know, all encompassing is more of a guideline, but I think what David, uh, and again, uh, for those of you on zoom, David said it could be sin when anger is hindering your relationship with other, with other people. And I think that goes a couple different ways, whether that's with people who you love and love you, if that's hindering your relationship with them, that's obviously, that's obviously bad. God doesn't want us to have strife with with, the, with, with anybody really, but especially those who are our brothers and sisters, if we're having anger with people in the church, that's something we really need to take a hard look at. Why are we, why is this happening? Why are we holding on to this? And then of course, the anger at other, uh, anger at other people, you're damaging, you're, 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 you're damaging relationships from them on up to God, because if you're that type of person who's angry, then that person looks at you and says, well, you know, they don't practice what they preach. It, it hinders a, a great, a great many things. Neil, the questions. A related uh, uh, topic would be the hate, H-A-T-E, uh, as in there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him from Proverbs 6, chapter 16, that lists them such as Haughty eyes and a lying tongue, different things. And you, uh, you said that was Proverbs uh, six, six, sixteen. Six, sixteen. Yes. Proverbs six, sixteen. Yeah, and the uh, following verses. But yeah, we want to make sure that the things that upset us correspond to what upsets God, and then don't let the sun go down on our anger because God's going to take care of the vengeance. Let let it go, and. Uh, there, there's so many things that are, again, pertinent um, to our world today and things that, you know, current events. And one of the things that one of the first things that came to my mind uh, when I was looking at this was the reaction uh, that we had to the murder of George Floyd. I don't know too many people who saw the video or saw what happened or learned what happened who didn't have a reaction of anger. And when you look at that, the, the, the anger over an injustice being committed uh, just right in front of everyone is that that's something that I think that people should be angry about. And I think I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly that that's the, that, that is the right response. When you see that, when you see things like God's word being demeaned. When you see that, I think that that's a perfect, uh, that's a perfect way to, um, to respond that you're not happy about that. But then it's what happens when you go beyond that and what's your reaction to it. And a lot of things, a lot of people in the world don't have the perspective of Christians and that we have when we're trying to, when we're encountering something like this and we want to use it as a way well, let's fix this. Let's do this. Let's be, let's, let's do this for good. And that doesn't always happen in the world. And we're left with destruction. We're left with, uh, we're left with more division and we're left with all kinds of uh, societal problems because people don't uh, approach anger from the way that God would have us to do. Well, 